folks, and welcome to our service of worship for the week of September the 27th. And uh, my name is Martha Martin. I'm the minister at Kingston Road United Church in the east end of Toronto. And you're all very welcome uh, whenever you are joining us, uh, wherever you are joining us for this service of worship for September the 27th. Um, thanks again to everyone who helped put the service together, to Eric McCarricker, our music director, and Keith Loach, Karen Brown, Paul Harris, Pat Martin, um, all of those people contributed to the service today. And also I'm using the, um, the work of an illustrator, and his name is Steve Thomason, uh, and I've used um, some of his, uh, his uh, illustrations during the scripture reading today, he's got a fabulous website and makes his um, his artwork available for faith community. So I've made a donation and um, uh, to his website so that we are able to use uh, his images. Um, just a reminder that our online Sunday school continues on Sundays at 10:30, and uh, there's an invitation, a Zoom invitation. Um, if you didn't get it, you can email um, either uh, kruc.info at gmail or myself uh, for the invitation. Or, and also, we have a Zoom friendship time on Sundays, a live Zoom call where we check in and connect with each other. That's at 11.45. And again, just give us an email if you didn't get the uh, invitation for that. Sunday, uh, um, you're invited to... Um, uh, to wear, if you're coming to the Zoom call, to wear an orange shirt. And this is in honor of Orange Shirt Day, which is actually on Wednesday, September the 30th. Uh, orange Shirt Day is in memory of the generations of children that attended residential schools. Um, and I'll be talking more about that um, in the service, in my sermon. Um, it's a commitment as settlers to educate ourselves about First Nations peoples and their history and to understand how to better walk a path of reconciliation, how to move forward. Um, and uh, so also check out uh, the Orange Shirt Day website just to see a lot of resources uh, there. And um, uh, there's a listing of events and uh, of things going on in your area. So check that out. That's for September the 30th. So uh, I'll just take a moment to um, to acknowledge the land as we always do at the beginning of our time together. Since time immemorial, First Peoples' lives and spirituality have been deeply connected to this land. We acknowledge this land as the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous peoples. We're grateful to have the opportunity to meet and work and worship on this territory. May we live with respect and gratitude for the land and for its peoples. Let's just take a moment of silence to prepare ourselves for worship. If you have a candle, you're invited to, uh, to light the candle. I light this candle to remind me that the light of Christ shines in me and in the world and in every one in the world in all of creation. God of wonder and love, God of dreams and visions, God of hope and forgiveness, here we are. We come, we dream, we hope. We worship. Let us pray. Loving God, we have been given a church family, a place we belong and people who care for us. Each of us have our own peculiarities, our own special ways, and still we are invited to be together caring for each other. 
We ask forgiveness when we are jealous or selfish or rude, when we are less than what we are called to be. May we come to accept our differences, embrace each other, and enjoy the sense of belonging that this community offers. Amen. Our opening hymn is Voices United, number 271. There's a wideness in God's mercy. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice which is more than liberty. There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. There is no place where earth's fadings have such gracious judgment in. There is plenty for redemption in the blood that Christ has shed. There is joy for all the members in the sorrows of the head. Troubled souls, why will you scatter like a crowd of frightened sheep? Foolish hearts, why will you wander from a love so true and deep. For the love of God is broader than the measures of the mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderful. Since we heard about God's promise to Abraham last week, both Hagar and Sarah bore sons to him. And each was promised to become a great nation, Ishmael and Isaac. The story of the Bible continues through the lineage of Isaac, who married Rebekah and became the father of Jacob and Esau. Jacob has been both a trickster and a dreamer all his life. With a pot of soup, he bought his brother's birthright, and later he tricked their father out of Esau's blessing. When running away for his life, he dreamt of angels coming and going from earth on a ladder. After he stole Esau's birthright, Jacob ran away to Rebekah's brother Laban. And there he fell in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel. And after working for Laban for seven years so he could marry Rachel, Laban tricked Jacob into marrying his older daughter, Leah, on the wedding day. Now Jacob ended up marrying both Leah and Rachel. And much later, he and Esau eventually reconciled. Before they did, Jacob dreamt again of wrestling with God and coming out the other side with a blessing and a new name, Israel. So Jacob had four wives and 12 sons, and in fact, he did have one daughter. The youngest two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, were the only children born by Rachel, who had always been Jacob's favorite and truest love. And so we pick up the story today in Genesis chapter 37, reading verses 1 to 8 and 17 to 36. And then we skip to the very end of their story, the brother's story, in chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. 
Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was born when ja Jacob was old. Jacob had made for him a long robe. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of his brothers, they hated him and couldn't even talk nicely to him. Joseph had a dream and told it to his brothers, which made them hate him even more. And he said to them, listen to this dream I had. When we were binding stalks of grain in the field, my stalk got up and stood upright while your stalks gathered around it and bowed down to my stalk. And his brother said to him, will you really be our king and rule over us? So they hated him even more because of the dreams he told them. Then one day Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. And they saw Joseph in the distance before he got close to them and they plotted to kill him. And the brothers said to each other, here comes the big dreamer. Come on now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the cisterns and we'll say a wild animal discovered him and devoured him, and then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard what they said, he saved Joseph from them, telling them, let's not take his life. Reuben said to them, don't spill his blood, throw him into the desert cistern, but don't lay a hand on him. He intended to save Joseph from them and take him back to his father. And Judah said to his brothers, what do we gain if we kill our brother and hide his blood? Come on, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not harm him because he's our brother. He's family. And his brothers agreed. And when some Midianite traders passed by, they pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and found that Joseph wasn't in it, he tore his clothes and he returned to his brothers and said, the boy's gone and I, where can I go now? And his brothers took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they took the long robe, brought it to their father and said, we found this, see if it's your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph must have been torn to pieces. And then Jacob tore his clothes, put a simple mourning cloth around his waist and mourned for his son for many days. And now we skip ahead to chapter 50 to the end of the story. But in between, the story tells us that Joseph ended up interpreting dreams for the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. And because the Pharaoh listened to Joseph and prepared for years of famine by storing food ahead of time, the people of Egypt had enough to eat, while many of the surrounding countries did not. And so Joseph became very powerful. And Joseph's brothers ended up coming to Egypt looking for food for their families and appeared before Joseph, whom they did not recognize at first. And when they finally admitted to what they had done to Joseph, Joseph ended up forgiving them and told them to go home and bring the rest of the family back to Egypt. And they did with Jacob and they lived in Egypt for many years. And so we pick up the reading again in chapter 50 verse 15. When Joseph's brothers realized that their father was now dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and wants to pay us back seriously for all of the terrible things we did to him? So they approached Joseph and they said, your father gave orders before he died, telling us this is what you should say to Joseph. Please forgive your brother's sins and misdeeds, for they did terrible things to you. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of your father's God. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And his brothers wept too, fell down in front of him and said, We're here as your slaves. 
But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I God? You planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it in order to save the lives of many people, just as God is doing today. Now don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. So he put them at ease and spoke reassuringly to them. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God within us, for the word of God among us, thanks be to God. I've read that a good family therapist could have saved Jacob and Joseph and the whole family a lot of trouble. You know the story is not going to end well when it starts now Israel or Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. In the familiar story of twin brothers Jacob, who was his mother's favorite, and Esau, who was his father's, Jacob steal his steals his brother's birthright through trickery and deceit, which led to years of alienation from his brother. Imagine if Jacob had learned from his own experience of not being the favored son, that it's a recipe for disaster when a parent shows favorites. Imagine if Jacob had been able to appreciate each one of his sons and his daughter Dina, who we hardly ever hear about, for their own unique selves. Imagine if Joseph had learned not to be such a button-pushing brat. Imagine if his brothers had learned how to just not let him get under their skin. And yet this is one of the great sweeping stories of our faith. The story of one very dysfunctional family and how the work of God continues despite, perhaps even through, these wildly imperfect people. It's a story with many different themes to explore, timeless themes like sibling rivalry, jealousy, destiny, forgiveness and reconciliation, dreams and dreamers. As I pondered which direction to take this weekend, as I looked for connections and the relevance of the story to today, I was pulled towards connecting the story to Orange Shirt Day, which is officially this coming Wednesday, September the 30th. And uh, so I did a little more research. I knew a little bit, not a lot, about what Orange Shirt Day was. And so I'm just going to read uh, a few things from their website, which is very easy to find if you just Google Orange Shirt Day, um, you'll, you'll find their website. And so it says, Orange Shirt Day is a legacy of the St. Joseph Mission, 
residential school, which operated from 1891 to 1981, uh, commemoration project and reunion events that took place in Williams Lake, BC. This project was the vision of Chief Fred Robbins, who was a former student himself. It brought together former students and their families um, uh, in the Caribou uh, Regional District, the mayors and municipalities, school districts, and civic organizations in the Caribou regions. The events were designed to commemorate the residential school experience, to witness and honor the healing journey of the survivors and their families, and to commit to the ongoing process of reconciliation. Chief Justice Murray Sinclair challenged all of the participants to keep the reconciliation pr process alive as a result of the realization that every former student had similar stories. Orange Shirt Day is a legacy of this project. As spokesperson for the reunion group leading up to the events, former student Phyllis Webstad told her story of her first day at residential school when her shiny new orange shirt bought by her grandmother was taken from her as a six-year-old girl. The annual Orange Shirt Day on September 30th opens the door to global conversation on all aspects of residential schools. It is an opportunity to create meaningful discussion about the effects of residential schools and the legacy they have left behind. A discussion all Canadians can tune into and create bridges with each other for reconciliation. A day for survivors to be reaffirmed that they matter and so do those that have been affected. Every child matters, even if they are an adult from now on. Also on the website is Phyllis's story in her own words, and I'd like to read that to you. I went to the missions for one school year in 1973 to 1974. I had just turned six years old. I lived with my grandmother on the Dog Creek Reserve. We never had very much money, but somehow my granny managed to buy me a new outfit to go to the mission school. I remember going to Robinson's store and picking out a shiny orange shirt. It had string laced up in front and was so bright and exciting, just like I felt to be going to school. When I got to the mission, they stripped me and took away my clothes, including the orange shirt. I never wore it again. I didn't understand why they wouldn't give it back to me. It was mine. The color orange has always reminded me of that and how my feelings didn't matter, how no one cared, and how I felt like I was worth nothing. All of us little children were crying and no one cared. I was 13.8 years old and in grade eight when my son Jeremy was born. Because my grandmother and mother both attended residential school for 10 years each, I never knew what a parent was supposed to be like. With the help of my aunt, Agnes and Jack, I was able to raise my son and have him know me as his mother. I went to a treatment center for healing when I was 27 and have been on this healing journey since then. I finally get it that the feeling of worthlessness and insignificance ingrained in me from my first day at the mission affected the way I lived my life for so many years. Even now when I know nothing could be further than the truth, I still sometimes say that I don't matter, even with all the work I've done. I'm honored to be able to tell my story so that others may benefit and understand, and maybe other survivors will feel comfortable enough to share their story. And also at the end of the page, there's a paragraph that talks about uh, where Phyllis is today. And Phyllis Webstadt is uh, Northern Shuswap from the Canoe Creek Indian Band, and she comes from mixed Sequemec and Irish French heritage. She was born in Dog Creek and lives in Williams Lake, BC. 
Today, Phyllis is married, has one son, a stepson, and five grandchildren. She is the executive director of the Orange Shirt Society and tours the country telling her story and raising awareness about the impacts of the residential school system. She's now published two books, The Orange Shirt Story and Phyllis's Orange Shirt for Younger Children. She earned diplomas in business administration from the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology and in accounting from Thompson Rivers University. And Phyllis received the 2017 TRU Distinguished Alumni Award for her unprecedented impact on local, provincial, national, and international communities through the sharing of her orange shirt story. In my preparation this week, I learned that the words of Genesis 37 verses 19 to 20 are inscribed on a plaque at the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, a memorial of where Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. And those verses, those words on the plaque are this. They said to one another, behold, here comes the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what will become of his dreams. Both Joseph and Phyllis had dreams, dreams of a future, dreams of a full and happy life, dreams that were initially hijacked and then took a long time to realize. Our resource materials for this week ask some great questions at the end of their reflection. How strongly do we stand firm to the dreams we have? How do we encourage others in their dreams? Do we find ourselves tempted to thwart the aspirations of those who think they are a little ahead of themselves, particularly those who are young? And I would ask, how are we as a church going to unleash the promise of their dreams? How have you seen God's dreams become real over time in your life or in your communities, in the world? Especially in these hard and unsettling times, may we continue to be dreamers, to dream dreams. And may we also be attentive to the dreams of others. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Just before we begin our prayers of the people, we want to hold up those folks that uh, the prayer circle prays for each week. Barbara Livesey, Sarah Condi, Sean Harvey, Rob Williams, Karen Hager, Linda Blix, Randy Rohrabeck, Keith Bolton, David Tridel, Bessie Stallworthy, and also this week we remember and hold in our prayers uh, the Reverend Jim Kirkwood, who uh, is the father of uh, one of our members, Jane Kirkwood Lazazara. And so our condolences go to Jane and the family and, uh, and hold them in prayer as well. Let us pray. Holy One, the world is full of people of parents and children and stepchildren, of siblings and cousins and step-siblings and cousins of families of all shapes and sizes. We pray for families, for families separated through violence or abuse, through choice or need. We ask that one day soon healing and restoration may occur. We pray for families torn apart through conflict and division, through difference of opinion and personalities. We ask that one day soon healing and restoration may occur. We pray for families struggling through lack of money or power, through natural or man-made disasters. We ask that soon, one day, healing and restoration may occur. We pray for families coping with loss through loss of family members, loss of income or home. We pray that one day soon healing and restoration may occur. Holy One, we pray for families, for our families, for those closest to us and those in our wider family circle whose needs we name now in a moment's silence. We pray that one day soon healing and restoration may occur. Spirit of love, in your mercy, hear our prayers. May we know the love all around us, the love of our brother Jesus, the love of our guide, the Holy Spirit, the love that your spirit sustains us and comforts us today and always. And we hold all these prayers, we hold them up in the name of the one who taught his community, our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have heard a great story. A story of a boy who became a man. A story of dreams. A story of jealousy. A story of 
rivalry and a story of the assurance of God's love. We all have a story, each unique with good chapters and bad, but like Joseph, our story is written with God coloring the pages with us. We leave to continue our stories. May God bring color and life to all of our stories this week. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 209, Go Make a Difference.